Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, the unscripted show that celebrates unsung heroes, myth busts historical lies, and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed our world. I'm your host, Scott Rank. Hey, everyone. Welcome to today's episode. We have a question from listener Paul Frazier, and I'm always up for taking audience questions. Paul submitted it by voice, which you can do if you go to historyunpluggedpodcast.com, and there's instructions on how you can leave a voicemail like this. All right. Take it away, Paul. What is the oldest extent tomb of a historical famous person? I know that the tombs of Cleopatra and Alexander the Great have been lost, but is there a tomb that we can go to that is verifiable as a historical person that is still in existence? Thank you. Well, Paul, thank you for that question about the oldest tomb that can be traced to a person. Now, I could just answer the question and give the name of that person or maybe a few people since it's a contested question. But that's not what I'm going to go for. And if you know me, I like to give a super long explanation to a question like this because I don't want to just give one data point as if you're in middle school and you have to cram for a test and and you have to fart out a fact and then you immediately forget it once you've memorized it. Because with an answer to a question like this about the oldest tomb, there are lots of questions behind the question. Why did this culture leave behind the oldest tomb that we know about? How do we remember a tomb attributed to a specific person? What do tombs mean to a culture? How does a culture understand death? What does an understanding of death mean to a culture and the rise of civilization itself? Really big questions, so I can't just answer this with one answer. Well, first, before I get into all this, what I'm going to do for this episode is, first of all, answer Paul's question. Then I'm going to talk about the importance of a tomb, mention different civilizations and how they dealt with death, and how tombs and sites of worship may very well have led to the rise of civilization. Then I'm going to get into the research and the arguments and the debates that archaeologists and anthropologists and historians are having about Neanderthal burial sites or other early humans thought about death itself. First of all, I want to touch on the thing that Paul alluded to in his question about Alexander's tomb being lost and how we don't know where it is, but there's lots of references to it in antiquity. So at one time, ancients knew where Alexander was buried, but they don't now. It seems like Alexander's tomb has become sort of the Elvis sightings of the ancient world. All sorts of people claim to know exactly where it is, but when we go and look at those places where people claim his tomb was, it isn't. So the location of Alexander's tomb is an enduring mystery. You can go online and some people claim that they definitively discovered it. But if they definitively discovered it, then it wouldn't be the controversy it is today. So there's still a lot of debate over where it is. After Alexander died in Babylon, the possession of his body was a huge subject of debate and negotiations between his generals, who would later lead the daughter states of the Alexandrian Empire, like Seleucus and Ptolemy. And some thought that Babylon was an obvious site of Alexander's resting place. It was one of the grandest cities in the ancient world. But others thought he should be buried in Aege. But according to one source, his body was hijacked en route back to Greece by Ptolemy. And one chronicler account says Ptolemy initially buried Alexander in Memphis, in Egypt. But in the late 4th, early 3rd century BC, during the early Ptolemaic dynasty, Alexander's body was transferred from Memphis to Alexandria, where it was reburied. Ptolemy placed Alexander's body in Alexandria's communal mausoleum. The tomb of Alexander became the focal point for the Ptolemaic cult of Alexander the Great. And there was sort of a pilgrimage site that sprang up to see Alexander's tomb because he was definitely a legend in the ancient world very shortly after his death for all of his conquests. Being a conqueror was a sign that you had the favor of the gods and you wanted to seek out the patronage of a person who was so favored of the gods. And there's all sorts of accounts in the ancient world of people visiting Alexander's tomb. In 48 BC, it was visited by Caesar. And then there's also accounts of the grave being robbed. Cleopatra took gold from the tomb to finance her war against Octavian. And Octavian visited Alexander's resting place shortly after the death of Cleopatra, who's said to have placed flowers on the tomb and a golden diadem upon his head. Suetonius writes that Alexander's tomb was then partially looted by Caligula, who reportedly removed his breastplate. Although this may have been embellishment by the chronicler trying to really overstate the case of how terrible Caligula was, that he would desecrate and dishonor Alexander, of all people. 
In 199, Alexander's tomb was sealed up by Septimus Severus when he visited Alexandria. Well, accounts of Alexander's tomb continue. When John Chrysostom visited Alexandria in 400, he asked to see Alexander's tomb and remarked, His tomb, even by his own people, know not. Later authors, like Ibn Abd al-Hakam, who was born in the 800s, and Leo Africanus, who was born in the 1400s, report having seen Alexander's tomb. Leo Africanus visited Alexandria as a young man and wrote, In the midst of the ruins of Alexandria, there still remains a small edifice built like a chapel, worthy of notice on account of a remarkable tomb held in high honor by the Mohammedans, or Muslims, in which sepulcher, they assist, is preserved the body of Alexander the Great. An immense crowd of strangers come thither, even from distant countries, for the sake of worshiping and doing homage to the tomb, on which they likewise frequently bestow considerable donations. Now, we don't know really what is happening in Alexandria. Perhaps Alexander's tomb was known, and maybe it was destroyed, and maybe locals believe this new site to be the burial place of Alexander, but it wasn't. There are all sorts of mausoleums and tombs to people that most historians do not think are accurate. For example, in the southeastern Turkish city of Shurnak, I went there one time, And I found that there was a mausoleum to Noah, and there was an enormous casket there where locals argue that Noah came here after the flood and was buried in this city. And it wasn't just Muslims who believed this. In the Middle Ages, it was a pilgrimage site for Christians, Muslims, and Jews who thought that the ark rested in the nearby mountains and Noah came down here. Now, to say nothing of scholars who don't believe that Noah ever existed or was borrowed from Mesopotamian myth. Even traditional Christian biblical scholars would think that the Ark of Noah landed north in Ararat. So tombs and mausoleums are contested all over the place is the point I'm getting at here. And if someone like Alexander, who's probably the biggest celebrity of antiquity, can have his tomb or mausoleum lost, imagine how hard it is to track down the identity of anyone else. I mean, we have burial sites and tombs and bones going back tens and tens of thousands of years archaeologists are constantly finding. And these are great sources of information, don't get me wrong. You can learn a lot about a person by their bone fragments. One of my friends, who's an archaeologist of Bronze Age Mesopotamia in the two or three thousands, used primarily as his data set teeth that he would drill into, and he could tell all sorts of things about the diets of these people. Did they eat beef? Did they eat pork? They ate mostly pork that shows that the state was breaking down its control because it didn't want pigs to be farmed by people too much since they would consume too much. But if their diet was mostly beef, that shows that the state had more control because it could direct what sort of livestock people were raising. And then from this data, he could determine whether a state was going through civil war, whether it was experiencing crop harvest, and you could learn all sorts of things from this. But to know accurately if a person was actually buried in the tomb or who was buried in a place is a lot harder. First of all, you have to have a system of writing. That really doesn't come along until the Sumerians. 5,000 years ago. Second, the tomb can't have been destroyed by grave robbers. Grave robbers loved to find the tombs of royals because there were valuable items buried there. And they might have messed up the epithet or the writing to indicate who is actually buried there. So the point being, it's really hard to determine if a person was buried in this or that place in the ancient world. If someone like Alexander could have his tomb go missing. Now I'm just going to answer Paul's question before I dive deeper into the subject. Now, here are some of the oldest sites that we know of. And listeners, if you can correct me, by all means, let me know. Now, we have to give it to the Egyptians for having likely the oldest sites that we know of. No one does death like the Egyptians. The pyramids are gigantic mausoleums to remember the pharaohs. And when you build something that large, it's going to stand the test of time. Now, most people would point to the Great Pyramid of Giza as the oldest pyramid we know of. But there's actually an older pyramid that connects to a pharaoh that we are sure is the person who's being commemorated there. That is the pyramid of Dejoser, or Dejeser or Zoser, depending on how you want to say it. And his pyramid is in the Saqqara necropolis that's northwest of the city of Memphis. It was built in the 27th century BC during the Third Dynasty for the burial of Pharaoh Dejoser by his vizier Imhotep. The pyramid originally stood 200 feet tall, with the base 400 feet by 400 feet. And it doesn't look like the Great Pyramid of Giza. It's more like a step pyramid like you would see in Mayan ruins. And it's considered to be the earliest large-scale cut stone construction. 
So Djoser was the first or second king of the third dynasty of the old Egyptian kingdom that lasted from the 27th to 22nd centuries BC. He's believed to have ruled for 19 years, or if the 19 years are stated in records indicate biennial taxation, then he ruled 38 years. But whatever the time he reigned, he reigned long enough to allow his plans for his pyramid to be realized in his lifetime. He must have been fairly powerful because the process of building such a structure would have been very labor-intensive. It required a lot more manpower than previous monuments of mud brick. So the royal government had a new level of control of resources, both material and human. And his pyramid set the stage for later pyramids of the 4th and 5th and 6th dynasties, including the Great Pyramids of Giza. And the Great Pyramid of Giza commemorates Khufu, the 4th dynasty pharaoh, who reigned from 2589 to 2566 BC. And his pyramid, the Great Pyramid of Giza, is the only surviving wonder of the world. Now, another tomb that we can connect to one person who comes from a different civilization is the tomb of Puabi. Puabi was an important person in the Sumerian city of Ur during the first dynasty of Ur around 2600 BC. Her status is somewhat in dispute, but some label her as a queen. There are cylinder seals in her tomb that identify her as a Eresh, which is a Sumerian word that can denote a queen or a priestess. Her tomb was discovered by British archaeologist Leonard Woolley in the Royal Cemetery of Ur, which was excavated between 1922 and 1934. Her tomb was unique among other excavations because there were a large number of high-quality and well-preserved goods that weren't stolen by grave robbers. The things found there included a heavy golden headdress, which can be seen today at the British Museum, that had golden leaves, rings, and plates. There was also a lyre that was found, complete with golden and lapis lazuli encrusted bearded bull's head, golden tableware, cylindrical beads for necklaces and belts, and abundance of silver and golden rings and bracelets. And like any royal of the ancient world, she was buried with attendants, servants, guards, a horse, lions, a chariot, and several other bodies. They're thought to have been poisoned when they were buried with their mistress in order to serve her in the next world. So this excavation was found at the Royal Cemetery at Ur that's located in southern Iraq. So those are some of the oldest sites we know, but I want to talk about the importance of a tomb and what it means for the civilizations and what tombs mean across history. So a tomb is a structure above ground compared to a grave that's below ground. But tombs can also be excavated underground. And sometimes you'll hear the word mausoleum, which is a small building dedicated to a dead person, generally a VIP. Tombs have been traditionally located in caves because you don't have to do so much digging. Underground or in structures designed specifically for the purpose of containing the remains of the deceased, along with their possessions or loved ones. And we have grave sites that date back very far. The Natufian grave in Israel dates to 12,000 BC and contains the remains of a man buried with his dog. So what a tomb was considered is the homes of the dead. And every tomb that was ever constructed was built with this concept in mind. But it was understood that this person's soul would live on in another realm. So personal artifacts or pets were interred with the deceased because it was thought they would be needed in the afterlife. And their pets and these items would continue on in a spectral form to accompany the deceased. Ancient cultures from Rome to Mesopotamia maintained that the dead lived on after life. And there are plenty of ancient stories concerning ghosts that have to do with the improper burial of the dead. Inscriptions cite the importance of a respectful burial and remembrance of the dead and the dire consequences of failing to do so. So what tombs do, they're a way for a society to understand the process of death. And perhaps there's an understanding that when this person exits the mortal coil and goes to whatever afterlife the society believes in, this deceased person can help the society if they ask for it. And if they respect their death with a good mausoleum, then it will benefit the society. If they disrespect their death, then they'll call on curses upon them. This isn't too different from Catholic or Orthodox churches that might have the physical remains of a saint, and people will pray to a saint, thinking that the saint will then go on and intercede to God. In terms of the earliest tombs we found, archaeologists think that they were actually houses. In prehistoric cultures, people buried their dead in their own homes with their daily effects. Later, people began to bury their dead outside of their homes, 
but the tombs they constructed were still built to resemble houses. 